Hey, what's going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of the Mike Force Podcast. It's your host, Mike. Today, had the opportunity to podcast Mr. Kyle Lamb. Look, Kyle Lamb is a retired sergeant major from special operations, serving in a special missions unit, also a Green Beret, and somebody that I highly respect. Um, someone who served on the streets of Mogadishu, Somalia, uh, did five rotations in Iraq, been all over the world in different capacities. And we could learn a lot from not only his career, but his life and his profession. The owner of Viking Tactics, a family man, um, man, one of the best conversations I had. He was part of the Philcraft survival experience where we bring people like Tom Spooner, Rick Hogg, you know, Eddie Gallagher, all these great human beings that have lived amazing lives and sit down, talk about their experiences do a little Q&A, and break bread. Um, our latest will be Tom Spooner in August with Rick Hogg, both mentors of mine in special operations. And at the end of this month, on July 31st, we'll have Tom Satterley, another special operations unit member that served on the streets of Mogadishu, Somalia, and led a long career in special operations who runs the All Secure Foundation with his wife, Jen. They'll be in the house in Philcraft HQ. Make sure you sign up at philcraftsurvival.com. Before we get started, I just want to talk a little bit about sleep because, look, sleep is the number one weapon that you could prepare yourself, that you have control of. You know, if you're like Jocko and you wake up at 4.30 in the morning, I hope you got seven, eight hours of sleep because you starting your day without sleep is a detriment to your capability, your cognition. Uh, all the things that you do in your daily decision-making, and it starts with a good night's sleep. When I transitioned from the military and special operations, working reverse cycle for most of all my combat deployments, and then had to transition into getting a good night's rest, it was very difficult to do. Something that's helped me is CBD and CBN. I will tell you right off the gate, if you are a military or first responder, depending on the tests they test you with, even though... CBD and CBN are hemp derived, meaning no THC, there is a chance you'll get a false positive. And the detection of that and the fact that first responders and military can't take that is mind boggling. You got great companies like Uncana, former Army Ranger that are working in legislation to get this approved, and I'll do my best. But I started a CBD, CBN company called The Wolf 21, sponsored and powered by Slumber. TheWolf21.com, you can go there right now and use Mike Force 15 to save 15% on your first order. TheWolf21.com, use Mike Force 15 to save 15%. Look, I'm not just pushing this because um, it's about money. I'm pushing it because I believe in it and I use it every single night. It's why I started a CBD, CBN company. So check it out, TheWolf21.com. And here we go, kicking off the podcast. Kyle, thanks for being on the podcast, man. Yeah, it's good to be here. How was your trip flying in? It was awesome. I just, it's a direct flight from yeah, Nashville. Direct, yeah, Nashville. direct flight from Nashville into here. Went to see my buddy Johnny Dog and got some words of wisdom. Two is one, one is none. Why start at a half? Nice. Nice. I like that. You know what that. I'm talking about with that? Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, because that's his thing. He's like, why would you carry this little gun yeah. that you can't shoot? He's like, yeah, man, you always talk about two is one, one is none. Yeah. And you got a half a gun with you. Oh, yeah. So we had a good, we had a good discussion. Did you guys shoot at all or did you? No, no. Yeah, okay. We just ate chow with him and his wife. And uh, yeah, they went to Park City, hung out there last night, got some Thai food and then uh, rolled over here today. And man, you got an awesome setup here. I appreciate it, man. The guys worked hard. I didn't do anything. I just showed up. But this, this used to be an empty building. That wall wasn't there. Six months ago, this place was just a, a barren wasteland it was just a, a empty warehouse yeah that's cool though they, they busted their butt do you know uh dan eibach i do yeah so dan lives in park city down oh, no the road. kidding well his his um really good the chop house he's a partner in a in a restaurant on the road called the chop house good food good meat uh, i always recommend that in park city if anybody's stuff about yeah i haven't i don't think i've ate at that place but yeah I'm, i got a good a good i got a good friend over there named tom davin that lives in park city as oh, well tom. you know tom i knew yeah. tom very well good dude. i love I wish he was the CEO of this company. <laughs> <We'd be laughs> he might better. be available, you know. 
uh, Ad, uh, Evan might be sick of him by now. I know. They, you I, know? Every time I see him, they're fighting. They're rolling around on the ground. It's weird. How long can an SF guy put up with a jarhead anyway? I Especially know. an officer. I know. They're you know? always fighting, man. <laughs> it's going to be crazy. Um, Let's talk about, because, you know, a lot of people know who you are, but they don't know the context for your background. And I, I hate even saying this to you because every time on every piece of media, you, you have to regurgitate your background. But I, I want to talk about some things in context as related to, like we had talked about before, leadership and some of your experiences. But can you give people, the, the, the audience, uh, some background? Uh, grew up in South Dakota on a farm. Too lazy to be a farmer, so I joined the Army. Uh, started out as a 31 Victor, which is tactical communications. Went to the 82nd as a paratrooper, 504th Parachute Infantry Regiment, the No War 04, as they like to call them. The other <laughs> outfits did, even though, you know, they were deep in it. Oh, yeah. Um, from there, I went to Special Forces. So I went to SFAS, mm. and I was in Arabic language school when Desert Shield kicked off. So I knew I'd be going right to Fifth Group, and then mm. from Fifth Group right over to Desert Shield, Desert Storm. So did that, uh, come back from the desert. And since I was still a combo guy, I was 18 echo by that time. I had to learn Morse code and all that stuff that now I don't think they even teach that anymore. No, they don't. So, no. uh, we, uh, we come back and they said, yeah, we're going to put you in battalion C and E. And I said, Whoa, Whoa, wait a minute now. Mm. I I'm here to be on a team and I'd got to do some pretty cool stuff over in Kuwait for that or, uh, uh Saudi and Kuwait yeah. during that nothing too high speed, but I got a little taste for it. So I decided to go to the unit selection course, went there, made it. So in the fall of 91, I went to the unit and, uh, I stayed there all up all but a year until I retired. I went to first group for a year, mm -hmm. did that. Uh, that was, a a good eye opener because I met, I met real special forces guys, Yeah, you know, which I'd met in fifth group as well. But to me, there's a, there's a difference between a real SF guy and a special mission unit SF guy, because when you're a regular SF dude out there, you're completely self-supporting. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't have this train of logistics that follows you around. So it was really cool for me to be exposed to that. And I made some lifelong friends. I got a good buddy out there, Mike Haugen, mm -hmm. that was a warrant officer. And, uh, yeah, that was awesome. Then I came back to the unit, was a troop sergeant major, uh, went to combat, with them, I'd, I'd done some other stuff with the unit. I went to the whole Black Hawk Down mission in Mogadishu back in 93. I mm. uh, did some stuff in Bosnia and other places and then went to Iraq for five tours. One tour was very, very short, but the rest were kind of our normal, you know, four, three, four month tours. Did that as a troop sergeant major, finished up. My last tour was as a CSM for our task force over there, which is probably one of the reasons I decided to retire. Mm. Just it. I don't know if you can relate to this or not. I'm not sure what you'll think when I say this, but driving a desk and Kyle Lamb don't go along yeah. real good with each other. And even to this day, you know, and you just met Melinda. So Melinda runs Viking Tactics. I don't. People don't believe that, but she she literally runs that company. And I get to I get to work where my strengths are at. And, you know, we talked about this before the podcast, but leadership. That's leadership right there. Stay in your lane yeah, and get the right people to do the right job. Yeah, combat make, leadership yeah, is what you're- Yeah, and make them successful. And that's the thing. She's, she's way better at all that stuff than I am. Why would I try to be in charge of that? I, I can't do it. I just can't. She can do it. She can do it with her eyes closed. Mm. Um, I can do what I need to do with my eyes closed. So that's why we work well together, you know? So yeah, I got out of the military the end of 2007. So I've been out mm. for a good bit now. Uh, got VTAC up and running and- Man, we haven't looked back. It feels like I got out of the army about a week and a half ago. Yeah, yeah. But it's been it's been many years, and we just haven't slowed down. COVID was nice. We did slow down for that, and yeah, we I slowed down traveling. We sold twice as many slings as usual, but we yeah we uh we had a great year, and I know you guys did as well. Yeah, yeah. I think we're three hundred fifty percent up for that yeah, last yeah. year. But you 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 made the transition now as a a deliberate decision. I, when I, when I was an ops sergeant major, I wasn't happy because I was doing work at a talk. And then yeah. I was like, I, I'm done. If I'm, if I'm a sergeant major and I can't do what the guys are doing, I'm going to step aside. Were you, were you put in a position where you, you had to be a staff kind of guy that was the, that was the progression in your career field? Yeah. I took over combat development directorate. So mm. I shouldn't take, say take over. I was the sergeant major there. Yeah. There was a, a Lieutenant Colonel, um, there with me and, 
it was a very good way to let me down lightly. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Like go from being an action guy to being that dude sitting at the desk and trying to herd half domesticated Angora cats around, you know, with what we were doing. Yeah. And it was good. I mean, it, it also, I've always been a gun guy. So they are working on guns and explosives and all that also tied in nicely with what I wanted to do when I got out. I didn't use that really to springboard VTAC. I used it just, I already knew all the people I needed to know. Yeah. I'd been going to the SHOT Show for years whenever I could try to make it happen. And then I decided to get out. And, you know, the way that I decided to get out, not that you're going to care about this, but some dudes that are in the Army right now or in the service right now might think about this or maybe just whatever job they're doing. I took my notebook. Good soldier always has a notebook and mm -hmm. a better soldier always has a pen to go with his notebook, right? Mm -hmm. So I took my little memorandum notebook and I, I started filling out a page, reasons to stay and reasons to go. And when I got done, I had more reasons to stay mm. in the military than go. And then all of a sudden, reasons started jumping from the reasons to stay to the reason to go side of the page. For example, guys at the unit were coming up to me, sport guys saying, man, when you get out of the army, we're going to bring you in to teach classes here. I'm mm. like, huh? Well, the reason I wanted to stay is because I like training those guys. Mm. Well, now that's a reason to leave because I can train them even more if I have that, that total focus on training and I'm, I don't have a day job at the unit there. And then my Sergeant Major called me in and chewed me up one side and down the other. And why are you getting out of the army and blah, blah, blah. And you're going to take a squadron. And he, he just tore me up. And I honestly thought we were going to fight. And I've known <laughs> this guy was an old C squadron guy and I thought we were going to fight. And he went and slammed the door shut. And I'm like, all right, we're going to get dirty here. And I didn't know. I mean, I was going to get my licks in. I didn't know what was going to happen, but I was going to get my licks in. And he goes, sit down, Kyle. And I'm like, wait a minute. Just a minute ago, you were pulling all this CSM crap on me, you know? And so I sit down, still think he's going to try to choke me out or head butt me or something. And he goes, hey, bro, I just gave you the SAR major talk. Now I'm going to give you the friend talk. Oh, you need to get out of the army. And I'm like, really? And he goes, yeah, man. He goes, I see what you're doing right now, and you could get out of the Army today, and you're going to be successful running a company and training people and doing what you do. You're, the way your brain works, you, that's, you would do very well at that. And I'm like, wow. Interesting. So once again, leadership, yeah. it all comes down to leadership. Here's a guy who, I mean, if he truly wanted me to stay there, well, he took his friendship and said, Okay, I did the part where I told you to stay. Now I'm going to tell you the truth, mm -hmm. which is you need to get the heck out of here and go do your thing. I, you know, there's times I think, oh, man, I wish I would have hung out a little bit longer. But those, those times don't last very long. So I'm really glad I did what I did. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, he's a great leader. You know, he's a guy that, that he truly cared about me and my family because he did that. He didn't look at just what he wanted. He looked at what would be the best for me. And I can tell you this has been the best for me. What, what is the, what, what is it about your brain and how it works as compared? I, I kind of know based on knowing you through, you know, whether it was training with you when I was in the SIF or, um, your reputation in the unit, which I knew, um, what, what is it, what's different about you versus other guys when it, when, and I don't mean to sound that like make it egotistical, but there's something different. And I, and if you don't have the answer, I have the answer for you. <laughs> well, I, okay. First of all, I have a, I have something that if I was a little kid, they'd try to give me dope. Mm. You shouldn't do that because yeah. just because I can't focus doesn't mean I'm not going to be successful. Mm -hmm. I look at my grandson. He is, he's ridiculous just like I am. Mm. And he's amazing. Yeah. And he's going to be hugely successful at whatever he tackles because the way his brain works, mm. the way my brain works is, and, and some of this, I believe I'll put it, I'll put it in perspective of being a commo guy. I can hear four conversations at one time and I can absorb all of them. Mm, interesting. Now that's not, yeah. you know, I probably shouldn't tell people that, Yeah. but I definitely don't want my wife to find out that I'm actually absorbing what she's saying. Yeah. Sometimes she goes to that voice where you can't hear it though. Like it, she hits that level that, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah, there's yeah. a certain level where dudes that I'm, and I'm not joking, you're laughing, <laughs> but if you've got bad hearing, there's oh, a certain level that women I can't have hear any, I can't that pick you it up. can't, yeah. yeah, you can't the hear decibel, that. Yeah. So, I'm free copping. That's what they would call it yeah. in Camo. You know, back when I was in, we didn't have free copping. We had KY 57s, you know, that we were, that's how we got everything to be secure. But free copping, I'm, my brain, like since we sat down, I've thought about stuff that has nothing to do with this podcast. Yeah. A bunch of stuff. Yeah. And I think that's why I've been successful with what I've done 
is my laser focus when I need it, but then I've got wide focus when I need that. Mm. And I bounce back and forth freely amongst them. I have a notebook with me 100% of the day Yeah, because of that, because I have ideas. That, that's how VTAC has made the products that we've made. I'm like, oh, I got an idea. It's three o'clock in the morning. Get up. Don't lay in bed and go, I got to remember that. Because guess what? You're never going to remember it. Yep. Get up, write that note down, um, go back to bed. And then in the morning, you'd be like, oh, yeah, that was a great. You'll ne- you won't even know that you did it. Yeah. Um, so I think that for me being... I don't mind working. Mm. You know what I mean? I guess that's part of it too. I'm yeah. not, I'm not a lazy person. Good work ethic. Yeah. Yeah. I don't like to sit around. I like to sit around and drink a cup of coffee, but then it's like, okay, we got to get going and do what we're going to do. I don't have a, as good a work ethic as my wife, but that's another thing. She keeps me honest as far as keeping me moving. And and that's another thing too, for guys like us. And when I'm, when I say that, I'm not, that's not a derogatory comment. That's a positive comment that Guys in the military and guys like you and I, because we're very much alike, we need somebody to keep us, one, keep us positive. We need each other to keep ourselves positive. And we've got to have that person with us that has our best interest in mind. Mm. Now, if you got people that work at your business like that, that's awesome. But not everybody has that. Some people have to rely on just their spouse to be that person or their children or their preacher, whatever it is, but you got to have that person that helps to one to protect you from yourself. And that my wife does that a lot. She's like, no, 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 shut up. Mm. And I'll I'll get mad. Like what? And then I'm like, she's 100% right. (laughs) Shut your mouth. Yeah. You know what I mean? So she's got your best interest. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things I've noticed, you know, that you say, you constantly say, take the bad and just get rid of it. Take Mm. the, the, if something's not positive, get rid of it. Mm. I've, I've done that years ago to the point where I try to hang around with positive people. Mm. If people are negative, it takes me down that route super fast. And I don't need to go down that route because there's nothing good comes from being negative. And if you can't influence it, just go the other direction and be positive and, you know, and, and, and find something that works for you there. So I don't know if that answered your question about how my brain works or, or how I work, but I mean, we're, I don't know all your little secrets but I bet I could figure them out in about 15 minutes. Oh yeah. I believe that. You know what I'm saying? And that's just from knowing people. I think that also goes back to running selection courses. Yeah. When I saw dudes, I'm like, Oh yeah, that dude's toast. Just cause I could see, I could see his attitude with another human being. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, Nope, that guy's gone. And I'd look at another guy and he wasn't like the Joe Eater poster boy, but I seen how he was acting and intermixing with people. I'm like, Yep. That bro is going to be successful. Yeah. And I'll tell you most of the time with military dudes, I've been right on that. Not 100%, but, but pretty, pretty close to that. And you've got to see people at their lowest point to, to see that. And I like that. I like to see what people are really made of versus this little glossed up, you know, the, Oh, what were the pictures that the kids used to glamor shots? Yeah. Yeah. You see these glamor shots and you're like, that ain't, that ain't really? real, bro. What's real, you know? And <laughs> head tilted sideways, yeah, got a perm yeah, in yeah, your head. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about. I mean, you just mentioned it, but you, there's something very when, when you're. It's like when you're training. When you like, I realized over years of training that now I can identify all the behavioral indications of somebody potentially going to be unsafe. Right. You see the eyes. You see the hands. You see uh, erratic movement. And you're a man early on as a leader who is assessing and selecting and judging uh, that kind of dynamic for the most elite men in the world at their job, at their specific profession. What are some of the things that you look for in, in somebody who you knew was going to be successful? Are there characteristics that, uh, specifically in that job and that profession, that you were like, th- those are the things, those are the characteristics that's going to make you successful? Well, I can say what's not going to make you successful. Some of the the guys that were chess beaters that, you know, a lot of those guys went by the wayside and that doesn't mean you got to be quiet. That just means that you're, you're not the chess beater. Um, I would say that guys that have zero, just zero quit. Mm. There's no quit. And for me, I've got quit. I'm just too scared to quit. Yeah. So luckily I'm more scared than I am. I am a quitter. Mm. So being scared has kept me from quitting all those. And, and I'm honestly, I'm not really joking about that. That's a serious, that's, 
that's just how I operate. You know, I'm like, oh man, I, this okay. I got to do it. Mm. You got to do it because I'm not going to quit. Mm. Um, confidence and competence are two different things. Confidence sometimes is confusing, but competence is not. Mm. You know, and if you can see how that person is competent, um, and and I was going to tell you too, I was evaluating the guys that were putting me through SFAS. You know what I mean? I'm looking yeah. at those oh, dudes yeah. and I'm yeah. thinking that guy's a douchebag. Yeah. Sizing them up. Yeah. And it's like, okay, whatever. And to this day, and, and I know you do this too. You walk into a room. What do you do? You size everybody up. Yeah. That's yeah. just what we do. Yeah. Now that doesn't mean that we're in there to pick a fight. That just means that that's what you do. And I think when you go into a situation, whether at a restaurant or whatever, sizing people up is part of that because then you can keep your family safe. That preparedness is learning to read those indicators of what people are mm. doing. Um, those indicators that you see in students are also going to be the indicators that bad guys have mm -hmm. because they're going to do something unless they're like a stone cold killer. You're, there are going to be indicators. They're going to happen. You know who Alan Elishwitz is? Mm -hmm. The knife guy. Yeah. He, uh, well, we talked about this yeah, the other yeah. day. I think that got lost out in the cloud somewhere, but uh, Alan is a good friend of mine and he has, he analyzes pre-fight indicators and then he shows you videos. It's like, man, it's just awesome. It's, it's pre-fight indicators that are different than a lot of the stuff I've seen because I'm not a big, I'm not a big street fighter. Well, that's how he grew up. Yeah, you know, he's yeah. an Asian dude, half Asian dude that, that, that grew up fighting a lot mm -hmm. and lived in some countries that were pretty rough. Well, he, he learned that. And then he can also show you in videos, you can see those pre-fight indicators. So I don't know, did that kind of answer that? Yeah, or? yeah, no, for sure. You, you, when you, when you look at the traits that you had as a leader, what makes a competent leader? You know, you're talking about competency. What makes a competent leader? Because, you know, I reflect on team sergeants. Um, uh, I won't say his last name, but Joe Brad was a leader of yeah, mine. Yeah. Phenomenal leader. Uh, somebody I highly respected. So I look, at, I look at guys like that and I go, that's a leader. You know, he's, he's, he's set yeah. the standard. Right. So when I look at a leader... And, you know, I hope someday somebody goes, oh, yeah, Kyle Lamb, you know, he was a great leader at one time or whatever. Well, I think, first of all, credibility. Mm. So credibility is not something that you is bestowed on you because of who your mom and dad are. We had that. We, they called him Cornwallis and, you know, Lord Howe and these guys that came to America. They weren't credible, really. They mm. were they had their leadership or their rank bestowed on them where our guys in our country had to kind of earn mm. what they got. So credibility is earned and lost every day. And you know that yeah. because there's dudes in this business that we're in right now, this tactical business, this, you know, whatever, they were like great dudes in the military. And then they got out of the military and they dropped all their credibility. And now they're just, I don't know what they are, Yeah, you know, and then that's, that's too bad, but that's, I mean, that's just kind of how it is. So credibility is one thing. Um, being able to motivate people. So how do you motivate people? I mean, I know that I had a, an unbelievable leader when I first got to the unit, a guy named John Hale. And John would motivate us by giving us more responsibility or delegating authority to us to do stuff. And he would ultimately still be responsible, but he would delegate that authority. And whenever somebody gets more authority, what do they do? They perform at a higher level. Mm. If you want to see how somebody that can pressure, perform, yeah. step them up a little bit. And then what that also does is allows you to step back and say, okay, now you perform that at, at that higher level. Now give that same support to the dudes around you when you're not in that leadership position. So I think if you're in a leadership position and you think like, think you're the be end all, end all in that leadership position, you've already failed because mm. your job should be to train up the next, the next level of leaders. Mm. I was just reading a book today and I thought it was, I thought it was pretty good. It said something about um, leadership is not letting people walk all over you. You can have anger as a leader. And I know that, and I've felt that, but sometimes society tells you, you can't be like that. Mm. But let me tell you, if you don't have fire in your gut as a leader to, to take care of your people, like get mad and take care of your people, then what's your problem, man? Yeah. You know where's what I mean? Passion? Like, yeah, where's, who, passion where's that you? passion? And, and, Passion and anger, anger to me, you're going to, your feathers are ruffled and, and you're going to, things can go south sometimes when you're angry, if you don't, you know, kind of check it a little bit, but 
I believe that that spoke to me because you can have anger. If you constantly walk around as an angry person, people quit listening to you. Mm. But if all of a sudden it's like, here's the deal, and you take it to a level that these guys have not seen for six months, they're going to be like, whoa, he's pissed. Yeah. And what's going on? And I mean, I, I, I'll give you an example. I had my team one time. We were driving to an after action. We just got off a helicopter. And we're driving back, and they are, they're bitching and moaning, and ju- they're just going off. I'm like, okay. I let him go. And then the van stopped. And I said, okay, listen up, guys. When we get in that hot wash, I don't want you to say one single word. Mm. And I was mad. Yeah, yeah. And they knew, I, and I was mad, not at them. I was mad at the situation. Yeah. And they were like, ooh, he's pissed. Now, I wasn't trying to not let my guys speak. They'd already told me everything that needed to be passed on. But I wasn't going to let this turn into a, you know, hollering contest in this after action. But when it was my turn to speak, I was mad. I was really mad. And guess what? We had an awesome troop star major. He took the dudes that were mad. We sorted it out. Mm. We became good buddies after that. And that, you know, and that's, to me, that's where, where, what, if you can't control guys like us, Mm. well then I'm sorry, man. That's, I mean, I have no problem controlling dudes like you and I. Yeah. Because I'm the same kind of person. Yeah. Let them get it out of their system. Let them be mad. Let them, you know, do whatever. Um, and then the other thing, and and this is one of my, I, I'd say it's, it's not really a pet peeve. It's something that's very disappointing to me right now in America. When you're in a leadership position, you should have your people's back. Mm. And in America right now, and I'm not talking about Joe Biden. Okay. I'm, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about American law enforcement, American military, and their leaders, a lot of them don't have their guys back. Yeah. Well, how, how, can you, how can you perform if you know that your leader doesn't have your back? You know what I mean? That's, to me, that's one of the most important. Now, having somebody's back doesn't mean that you're overlooking their deficiencies. But a law enforcement guy has a chief or a sheriff or whatever, and they go out and they do something that they've been taught to do, and they, they did what they thought was right. And then they get thrown under the bus with the media or with their leadership or whatever. You've just lost, you've lost all your credibility as a leader and you've just lost the loyalty of everybody that's following you by doing that. Yeah. So you've experienced a lot of combat and I've uh, often men like you have experienced that combat, the loss of teammates, the loss of, uh, you know, these, these catastrophes have created the most significant lessons learned in combat. Do you have any specific lessons learned that impacted the way you thought about how you were as a person, as a leader moving forward that you, that you took away from it and you went, I will never do this kind of thing, or we need to change the way we do business that you could talk about. I know a yeah. lot of it. You can't. Yeah. Okay. So let's, I'm going to, I'm going to give you a couple of, for instances. So let's go back to Somalia in 93. Yeah. That was not, to me, it was not a defining moment in my life. Mm. It, it really wasn't because it was just me doing what I was supposed to do. Really, that's what, it, that, that's what it's all about. You know, a defining moment is like having children. I mean, that's, the def- that's like, yeah. oh, crap, this is real. Now I got to, they, what, they, they're, they're, they're crapping all over. They're blowing their, I mean, what, what am I going to do here? Well, in, in Somalia, I had leaders that I could look up to. And then I had leaders that I didn't look up to, Mm. but I was very, very blessed because John Hale was my team leader and I could see how he, how he operated in that environment. So one, he supported his team 100%. Two, he trained us hard, hard, hard. He motivated us by, by competition. He motivated us by, by giving us enough rope to hang ourselves with. He motivated us by his passion. So all that stuff, I'm like, that guy's the man. I mean, is he going to be the, the, the best on everything we do? No, he's not going to be the best, but doggone it. He's going to be there and he's going to give it 110%. And that's all you can ask of somebody. The other thing that happened there, Earl Fillmore was one of the guys on our team that was killed in Mogadishu and Earl and John were best friends. Mm. So let's just think about that. So you're in the streets of Mogadishu and a ranger gets killed. And I'm, I'm not trying to, I'm not saying that one life is worth more than the other. That's not what I'm saying. But if it's your friend that's died, it's different than somebody that you don't know. Yes. Yeah. And that's just the way it is. I'm yep. not, I'm, I'm not belittling what they did. So John Hale is standing there 
over Earl when Earl is dead, mm-hmm. his best friend. And when, when we got the radio call that Alpha 2 was dead, I was on Alpha Team. Dude, you hear that? What, what do you think that did to our, our motivation? Yeah, in the, like, in the heat of it. Holy crap, yeah. Earl's, what? I mean, it was unbelievable. And at the time, I was working on a ranger that was, was bleeding very badly. He ended up passing away later that night, a guy named Jamie Smith. So what did John Hale do? He gets himself together and he gets on the radio and he says, all elements, this is Alpha One. This is what we're going to do. Wow. Dude. That chills. Wow. Yeah. Just think about yeah. that. It gives me chills every time yeah. I say that because what was his, what was his focus? His focus was the mission. He understood Earl was dead. There's nothing he could do about that. But his focus was so strong. He loved Earl. I yeah. mean, we all did. Earl was amazing. But he said, we're going to take, this is what we got to do. And he knew that him saying that would put everybody back in the fight. Mm. Now, when I asked him years later about that, I said, why'd you do that? I mean, what went through your head to do that? He goes, oh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Well, I know. He's a great leader. Yeah. That's what went through his mind. Wow. And, and guess what? It wasn't like, oh, I'm going to be a great leader and I'm going to make this statement. No, he did what needed to be done. What's funny about that, when I first came to Alpha Team and C, John Hale come up to meet me, and John was one of the thickest dudes I've ever met. And what I mean by that is he was almost as thick in his chest from front to rear as he was side to side. <laughs> this dude was like a barrel-chested freedom fighter. Awesome. Tough, tough dude. Very low-key, soft-spoken, hilarious guy, just a stud. But he was a thick cat, you know? Mm. And I'm like, this is my new team leader. Oh, crap, you know? <laughs> and I'm this little skinny dude from South Dakota. And he goes, hey, uh, welcome to the team. Just do what needs to be done. What the heck does that mean? Do what needs to be done. I'm like, I don't, oh, crap, what does that mean, out. you know? So I, I ended up taking uh, the next couple of days. I, I was like, what do I need to do? And he's like, I told you, do what needs to be done. So it was like day three, I'm on the team. And I said, I come in there, I, I'm trying to figure out what needs to be done. And he says, if you can't figure out what needs to be done, I'll give you something to do. He goes, look around. If there's a piece of equipment that we need that we don't have, start working to get it. If the trash is full and needs to be emptied, go dump the trash. Uh. If you got to sweep the floor, sweep the floor. If you don't need to be here, he used to say, don't be stacking BBs. Have you ever tried to stack BBs? <laughs> it's impossible, right? So in the army, the army likes to stack BBs. Yeah. They give you a task that you can't complete yeah. and they tell you to do it until 1700 and then you can go home or yeah. 1800 or whatever. John Hale used to come in the team room and he's like, looks like you guys are stacking BBs. And he'd walk out. We're like, Roger that. Going that home. meant yeah. get out of there, go to the range, go yeah. home, be with your family, do whatever. But uh, yeah, so, so lessons learned, you know, from John Hale like that, that was super powerful for me. And I still, to this day, I, I think about John a lot. Yeah. Um, we lost John a couple of years ago. He committed suicide. Wow. And a lot of that, I believe stemmed from what happened in Somalia. Yeah. You know, he, he struggled with that. You can't take anything away from that dude. Yeah. He, he did that. That, you, you know, that's one thing I've struggled with, but talking to his brother, he's like, you know, John did, he did that to take care of us. And it's like, man, it's true. It's, yeah. it's absolutely he true. Burden anybody. He didn't want to burden anybody. Mm. So the dude kept leading until the very end ah. and you can say whatever you want, but that's how, that's, that's how I perceive that. Yeah. Now, when I go to, to, uh, you know, fast forward to me being a leadership position, going down range and doing stuff, uh, as a troop SAR major, I was really lucky because I had guys below me that they knew they could do whatever needed to be done. Mm. They, they understood that. And then I was able to take what John Hale taught me and I was able to say, okay, here's these guys that are the team leaders. All right. Here's your left and right limit. Yeah. Let's go. Let's, let's do this. Now I didn't make all the decisions I made were not perfect, but I had guys that truly cared about me that were subordinate to me and they would step up and tell me if I was, cause I'd ask them, okay, what's, what's going on? Yeah. Well, this, 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 okay, Roger that let's fix this. Let's get, you know, cause you want to be efficient for, for the mission. Um, and that's gotta be your focus. I think sometimes folks, folks are misguided in law enforcement and military. They think that taking care of people is the most important thing. And it's not, 
Yeah. Mission's the most important thing. Yeah. And while you do that, you take care of the right people. Mm. So am I t- speaking out of both sides of my mouth? No. There's a lot of people that aren't the right people. They're not going to be there to help you, you know, be successful at your mission accomplishment. So look around you. Who are the right people? And let's accomplish that mission with the right people. Yeah. If they're not the right people, fire them and get the right people in there mm. and get, get busy with it. Some people say, oh, we can't do that. That's a bunch of BS. Mm. You, you're always in a position where you can get the right people and take care of the right people. And once again, the most important reason for that is to accomplish the mission, whatever yeah. that might be. Or you, I was um, with, uh, I say his name because he's all over social media with Black Rifle and everything, Jamie Caldwell. And seeing him operate as a team leader was inspiring to me because um, everybody looked up to him. But I noticed that as a leader, he was very, uh, in that team leader position, very much in charge, experienced, but listened to his guys, but was very definitive and clear and concise about his guidance. Yeah. And so he, he showed all the right indications of a leader. And, and the troop sergeant major at the time, Johnny L., he didn't have to really do a lot because his TLs were squared away. Was being a team leader versus being a troop sergeant major the pinnacle of oh, your yeah. experience? Yeah, 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 yeah. By far. Yeah. You got these fire breathing dudes that are all around you and you just have to swim as fast as you can because they're biting at your butt every day. Mm. And uh and Jamie, I put him through OTC. Yeah. So I've got some good Great Jamie guy. Caldwell stories. I've got a lot of time for Jamie and I actually hooked him up with Black Rifle Coffee to to get him yeah, uh, working, doing the fishing stuff with them. And uh, he's all, all, he was an avid fisherman, even yeah. on active duty. And I remember, yeah. you know, he's doing the bass boat thing and traveling all over the place. And now he's just crushing it. He's, it seems like he, he looks happy and oh, yeah. I love to see yeah. him doing what he's doing. You know, we, we talk about, um, gentlemen like John Hale and, and guys that, you know, I don't know if you know about, um, um, they're, they're anyways, there's, there's other guys in the unit that have uh, taken their own lives. There's a whole bunch of SF guys yeah. and it's a tragedy because, when that happens, um, the people who are left behind are asking the questions, why? Right. And only the people who have, have whatever that was going through their head, understand the real reason why. And I often wonder what could be done better to support specific guys that have that experience. Because something that scares me is, you know, I did nine trips down range and, uh, a lot of my time wasn't spent in the unit. A lot of my time was spent in that stuff. And, and, when I look cumulatively at my experience, it doesn't compare. It pales in comparison to a lot of the guys who are war fighting, even still, some of my peers now that are still war fighting, that are experiencing a lot of trauma and that over a long period of time becomes difficult. And then they transition and they're not like you. They're not like me. They don't have a business aspiration, an entrepreneur mind. And then they find themselves in a dark place because everything they knew and they loved because they had a passion for it, is no longer there. Is there a path or is there advice that you would give to men who are getting out of USASOC, of the command, or wherever, and they're trying to transition and find themselves? Yeah. Uh, as I said a minute ago, you need to have a mission. So do you ever have dark thoughts? Yeah, all the time. Yeah. Yeah. So what gets you out of that? Focusing on something other than yourself. Yeah. And that's, and, and I'm not saying it's bad to focus on yourself sometimes, but we've got to get I've got to walk away from myself on a regular basis and do something different. So if, if you go into a SF get together, put you in a dark place, then don't go to that SF get together. If you drink an alcohol, put you in a dark place, dude, don't drink alcohol. You know what I'm saying? You, yeah. You've got to do a little bit of, of looking in the mirror and be like, man, I can't. And if you need help, we can get you the help. But you've got to want to have the help first. Tom Spooner's a very good friend of mine. I'll be I'll be with him next weekend. Yeah, Tom yeah. is just Tom is just an amazing cat. I love Tom. Yeah. yeah so he's he's taught me. Yeah, I put him through OTC as well. Unbelievable dude. But he has taught me so much in the last several years because of Warrior's Heart. And one of the things is you've got to own it. You 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 have got to want to get better. Whatever that is, if you feel like you got gremlins crawling around in your brain, then tell somebody and let's try to help you out. If you feel like you're drinking too much or you're, you're, you're taking, taking painkillers or whatever it is, we can help you with that. Go to Warrior's Heart. They're going to help you with that. And you're going to be around a group of people that has similar issues there. So I guess my, I guess my point is I don't, have the, I don't, I don't know how to fix that. And I, I, will, I, I do want to say something else. 
Tom called me one day and he gave me a, a guy's phone number and said, I have to be this guy's ranger buddy. And I tried, but several years later, he ended up killing himself. Mm. And I started second guessing that I hadn't tried hard enough. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, this is the dude. I didn't really know the guy, but I'm, you know, he knew who I was and was in the unit. And all of a sudden he's having issues. And Tom is telling me to be his big brother deal. And the guy just kept kind of, he was really hard for me to communicate with. Um, hard to get a hold of. And then he just didn't want to talk or whatever. And I'm, I was trying, but I felt like, man, I failed. I, I didn't try <sighs> hard enough. So when, when this starts happening, what do you do? You, you're adding rocks to your rucksack. And I don't care how much of a stud you are. A certain amount of rocks are going to, are going to weigh you down to where you can't move. Yeah. And I'd got to that point and I talked, I was talking that day to a friend of mine, Duke Krager, and he's a man of God and a warrior. And, uh, he has a, he has an outfit that he runs to try to help kind of guys like us spiritually. And it's the, the Island of Misfit Toys, which is kind of funny, but it, it, it speaks to us. You know what I mean? Like we are the misfit toys. So I called him up that day and I was, I was having a rough day, not as rough as the dude that killed himself, obviously, but man, I was just struggling with this. And I get on the phone with him and I, I, I just told him, I said, dude, I, I need some help, you know? So that's part of it. Go to somebody that can give you the help, whatever that might be. And he said, uh, you know, there's only one great physician and you ain't him. <laughs> So what are you doing, dude? That's not on you. Yeah. And it's like, whew, that rock was gone from my rucksack at that point. So what does that mean? Does that mean don't care about your muddy buddies? No, it doesn't. But when somebody decides to take their own life and they're successful, I'm going to let you in a little secret. There's nothing we can do about it. Once it's done, it, there's, there's nothing we can do about it. So don't let that suck you down to where they're at. So I'm like, man, so what do I do? I call Tom Spooner up. I'm like, bro, I need to talk to you. Cause he deals with that a whole lot more than oh, you yeah. and I do. Yeah. And and carries I, said, it. I said, bro, I just talked to Duke and I told him the story and he goes, you're just figuring that out. And I'm like, you're a dick. <laughs> you can't tell you know? me that before. <laughs> yeah. You know I mean? And, and that's why I've told some guys this because I, I don't want you to feel like if, if that happens, that it's your fault. Mm. Because it's not your fault. Take care of the people yeah. that are still alive. It's just, just you know, not. Focus on your wife. Um, focus on your kids. We got enough loved ones to carry around. Um, you and your buddies to take are your loved ones I'm talking and about. Somebody's the guys that are still body. kicking, if they need help, yeah. dang it, man, give them a call. I mean, there, there's some dudes that, that, that will listen. And, and, you know, maybe I did do something wrong. But hopefully I learned from it and I don't repeat that mistake again with another guy that's supposed to be my ranger buddy. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, for the guys out there listening, here's what I would say. Don't think you're tougher than anybody else because you're not. So go and get the help you need. And I'm going to tell you right now, the help doesn't, it, I wouldn't go to the hospital and that maybe people are going to be pissed that I say that, but I go to the people that can actually help you. And that's warrior's heart. That's you. That's me. That's other guys that have these similar struggles. Start talking to them. Hey, maybe you go see your pastor. I don't know. I'm not sure who that is, but if you talk to them and, and, you don't get help, then seek out somebody else. Um, I'm also a believer that post-traumatic stress is not completely psychological. Mm. I think there's a lot of physiological effects from what we've done that, that cause that. So don't feel like you're jacked up because you, I mean, I have the same feelings. It, uh, when they define PTS, hypervigilance. Yeah. Dude, what do you train people for? Yeah. You train them to be hypervigilant. Yeah, yeah. So you're taking something that some dude in a white coat or some chick in a white coat is going to say, oh, well, you're hypervigilant. That yeah. means you got problems. No, that means that I'm going to survive and you're not because you're an idiot yeah. for sitting at a restaurant with your back to the door. Mm -hmm. That's my job to make sure I protect my wife. And if I can't do it, she's going to be protecting me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So that uh, don't listen to some of these people that are out there that that they don't understand what kind of people we are. What do you tell that person? Yeah, they don't get it. They're never going to get it. I can look you in the eye when I when I said that you got this twinkle in your eye, like, heck yeah, man, hypervigilance. That's that's what I'm doing every day. Yeah, you know. Yeah.
So uh, is it a little weird sometimes? Yeah, it might get a little strange, but nobody's nobody's going to surprise you. At least I hope not. You know. Yeah, I so. when, when I went to the VA and in process VA in Texas, a great great state of Texas, the there was a noise that went off behind me because they were doing construction in the hallway, and I turned my head, snapped my head back just to identify what the sound was, and she said, "Oh, a little." a little hyper vigilant, are are we? And I'm like, uh, oh, okay. This is the kind of conversation this is going to be, right? And she's immediately, she's like honing in. You got combat. You are, um, you are a victim and you're dysfunctional. You don't know it yet. Yeah, and, you're and, not, yeah. yeah. And I, that, that clinical binary ones and zeros kind of assessment, it, it bothers me because, you know, guys who are conditioned for yeah. war, it's like a, it's like a military working dog that's conditioned for war. You can't just take a working Mao from the unit and put him inside of a, a, a living room and then expect that everything's going to be okay. And then start slam dancing and see what happens. Yeah, yeah everybody's going to get yeah. bit, right? You have to transition. You yeah, have and, to, and yeah. Not everybody at the VA is like that. Yeah. And, and I talked to some people at the VA that were very helpful in explaining, and that's, that's when I started to study this even more, because I wanted to know, I wanted to know what's going on, not just in my brain, but in your brain too. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, maybe this is going to really sound bad, but I'm just going to, you know me, I like to jump on hand <laughs> grenades. Wait, let's do it. Yeah. I don't know that we can fix anybody. Yeah. But I don't think they're broken. Yeah. So what's, so what's more successful? Taking what they can do and protect their family and they can do these great things. Mm. Let them do those great things. Don't make them, you know, like a, a warrior's heart. Have you heard about any of their, of any of the, of those guys doing like uh interpretive dance or, or uh watercolors? No, yeah, they're doing yeah. woodworking and oh, yeah. metalworking. Yeah. They're doing things that we would do. So that doesn't mean that interpretive dance is bad. I'm sure that if I had a couple chem lights, I could really stir it up. You know what I'm saying? But, but the bottom line is we're, we're not like that. We, yeah. We, I don't need that. I need to be around dudes like myself mm -hmm. or gals, same thing. Um, and just be open about it. Mm. Boom. Something goes off and you jump. We're all going to laugh because all of our hearts are going to be in our throats for a second there. What's wrong with that? Yeah. It's primal. Yeah. That's, it's like the survival dude, yeah, that's, primal instinct. Yeah. And, and I think that, some people forget that their ancestors had that same primal instinct. Yeah. Because guess what? If they didn't, they ain't here no more. Yep. The little boogeyman that looked like a big elephant with long hair smashed their ass, you know, and they're, they're no longer, their family tree would have been stopped right there. Yeah. So they actually, even these little dudes and dudettes that aren't like us, guess what? Somewhere in their, their line, yeah. they had some warriors because otherwise they wouldn't even be here. It might've yeah. been a thousand years ago, but whatever. So you, you transitioned and you started a business that it is and um, has become very successful. And what I've noticed about you is you, we talk about purpose and this purpose that you transition from uh, active duty into the passion that, you, that has become Viking Tactics. What is that purpose? And, and what have you done to carry that torch? Because you, you haven't passed the torch. You haven't checked. You didn't pass the torch, check out and say, Hey, I'm going to retire in a lawn chair in Florida. You, you got to work again. And I think a lot of active duty guys think this idea of retiring means that you hang it up, Yeah. but you, you transition and you, you carry that torch and you redefine your purpose. What is that purpose? And then how does that go forward for you with Viking Tactics? Well, if I don't stay busy, I'm going to end up in prison. <laughs> yeah. I mean, really, cause I'm going to do something I shouldn't do. Cause I'm just always in, I, I've always done stuff that was illegal, mm -hmm. you know, overseas. That's just everything we're doing is stuff that in America you'd get arrested for. Yeah. Um, so in America, we got to stay busy so we don't end up in prison. Mm -hmm. And I'm really not joking when I say that. I believe that same so thing. My purpose is to, to train men and women to be better. Mm. I honestly, a few years ago, I probably would have said, I'm going to train them to do tactics and shooting and leadership and all this. I'm kind of past that. Yeah. I'm going to train them however I can to be better. Um, one of the things I've been focusing on a lot lately is being better with our families. Because that's, to me, if you want to talk about where we are a fail, 
as a culture, we fail with our families. It's just, I'm just being honest. Yeah, the breakdown of the family yeah, unit. Yeah, breakdown right? of your family. You, you know, you treat your wife like crap or your husband gets treated like crap or your, your kids, you know, they don't even get honorable mention. They're just like there and mm -hmm. it's just bad. And luckily I learned, I think I've learned from my mistakes. Uh, my daughter would say, yeah, dad was around just enough. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we laugh about that, but we can all be better there. We can all be better moms, dads, grandpas, grandmas, whatever, you know, whatever stage of life you're in. So I would say that what, whatever I'm doing, I want to try to make people better. And I think what helps me is I've failed at most things, but I didn't stop when I failed. So if you would have said, if you shoot bad, you shouldn't, well, you shouldn't just shoot anymore. No, that's wrong. If you shoot bad, you should train even harder. So I, I was a guy that didn't shoot correctly and now I can hang pretty good. Yeah. Um, tactics wise, man, I didn't know if I, if I should go left or right or crap on my watch or whatever I was supposed to do. And now I teach guys to do that and gals to do CQB leadership, you know, and, and in leadership, that doesn't mean that I've been successful at everything, but it means that I've analyzed everything I've done. And when I say that I've been successful as a leader and I've been successful teaching leadership, don't, don't think that that means you're a good business person because in being a leader and being a good business person are two different things. Yep. They just are. Um, I think that the leadership qualities that we can help folks with will help them to be better in business, but we're not going to absolutely, I don't know a guy that's running a hundred million dollar a year business. Dude, I have no clue. I mean, good for them. I can help them with leadership, but I, and maybe the selection process, but I can't help them with, probably can't help them with their business as far as the, the minutia of that. Mm. Uh, but hopefully if they're really smart and good leaders are going to find the right people that can help them um, do that. So I guess my answer to that is a few years ago, I told my wife, oh, what am I going to do when I retire? And she goes, what do you want to do? And I'm looking out the window of our cabin before we built our house in Tennessee there. And I go, well, I want to hunt. I want to fish. I want to shoot, teach people to shoot. I like to write. I like to design products, you know, innovate. She's like, Hey dude, that's what you're doing right now. <laughs> so, so this is your doing. retirement. This is yeah, retirement. So, yeah. so, and you, 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 you're laughing, dude, this is serious, Mike. <laughs> Come on, bro. So funny. I, I'll tell you though, since that day, I've never looked back. Nice. Because why yeah. would you retirement? What the, what does that mean? Yeah. Retirement means you're going to die That's it. to me. So when I look around at the people that are healthy and are successful, they're not do, doing nothing. Yeah. They're, they have their mind engaged. And I also believe that if you don't lose, if you don't use it, you lose it. Mm -hmm. So whether it's getting up every morning and going for a four mile hike or, or shooting guns just to keep everything working or using your brain so that it stays, you know, stays functioning. I think that I, I don't plan on ever retiring. Mm -hmm. I have no plans of ever. I couldn't do that. Yeah. There's no hanging it up. There's no, definitive, no, no, I have, yeah. I've, I've refocused where I spend my time. I'm doing more foraging now. So that's fun. I, but it's, that's a lot of work, you mm -hmm. know, a lot of sweaty, nasty work where you're getting burned. And the other day, my wife goes, how did you get that sunburn on your arm? And I'm like, yeah, it kind of hurts. I got it from welding. I didn't have a long sleeve shirt on. I was welding. Dude, I burnt the crap out of the inside of my, my elbow. And man, I learned something there, you know? So I was, I was nursing that. I was like third degree burns for a few days. And finally I got it all squared, not third degree, but very badly burned. So man, I'm learning so much. And that's the other thing. Mm. Go out and learn something. History. I talked to one of your guys who was a history teacher and, and we yeah, got, he's going, awesome. yeah, we got going down that line of, of the history lesson and, and, uh, man, learn, just get out and learn, but tackle something you've never done. If you've never forged a knife, try to do that. And I'm going to tell you what, it will drive you insane, mm. especially for a guy that likes to perform. You're going to have knives that are nowhere near straight. <laughs> it's, it'll piss you off so bad. And for me, I've worked and worked and worked and now I can actually make a knife that's straight, mm. you know, no. So now it's move on to what's the next step to do that. Or maybe you want to start woodworking, or maybe you want to learn to play the guitar. I don't know, whatever makes you go, but, but work hard at it and man, make your brain work, you know? Well, I did going back to the very beginning and 
and you know, uh, closing this out. I think that's part of what makes you different. And I have similar characteristics and traits in that is that you're always willing to learn and evolve. There is no end solution. There's like people go, are you successful? What does that mean? There is no end moment where you stand at the pinnacle and you're a success. Like you get selected yeah. and when you're done and you're selected, that's only the very beginning. It, you, it, just because you got selected doesn't mean it, that's the end of your journey. That's just the beginning of the journey. And when you have this mindset, which you do, which is why you're always progressively learning and crafting and, and figuring out new ways to evolve, that's what a productive and healthy life is about. It seems what I, I look at you and I want to be you in, in, you in, don't be in this 10 years. I do. <laughs> I, I, I saw you when I was on active duty and you had transitioned and you were in the grind of the tactical thing. And I saw that and how it evolved. And I see you now and you're at a different place. Yeah. It seems like I've never seen you so grounded, so content with where you're at. And I was talking about, uh, with you and, and the wife downstairs. Like, I want to farm because I want, not because I have this idea of preparedness, even though that's a piece of it. It's because I want to learn uh, permaculture, an entire new world that I don't know. Yeah. And I want to, I want to, I want to hone that craft and I want to um, evoke all of these things that make me interested in it. And so I'm digging in the weeds, literally in the books I'm learning. And it's such a beautiful thing. And if you have that kind of mindset, like you do, there is no end state. There is no. Yeah. Hand and it. I think one of the things that sometimes guys like us have a problem with is making money. Mm. So we, we've had success by we, I'm talking about you and I both. Yeah. We've, we've done, we've done well. Yeah. So what's enough? Yeah. And I guess that's, that's kind of the point that I got to, I set of, and I probably shouldn't even say this on here, but I'm going to, once again, <laughs> I'm going to say it set. If you have goals, set goals. And if you need to set a fiscal goal, then set a fiscal goal and run as hard and constantly as you can to that goal. But then when you get to that goal, guess what? Then take a breather and do something else that's going to, that, you know, set another goal that isn't fiscal. And I say that because if you continue to chase how much money you've got, man, you're never going to be happy. Yep. And mm. I'm going to give you a couple examples. You know how much money I make when I forge an ax head? Zero. Negative. Yeah, it's actually a negative. When I make a knife, it's also a negative. Mm. When I go hunting, it's a negative. Mm. When I go fishing, it's a big negative because I'm a really crappy <laughs> fisherman too. When I go bow fishing, it's a negative. Mm. But those are what keep, they, they, they drive me. You know what's better than going shooting? Taking your grandson shooting. You know what's better than going Fishing, take your family fishing mm. or a buddy of yours. You, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, it's better than forging an ax head. Bring in some dude that has the same dream that you had. Can I teach him how to do it? Not really, but I can show him how to heat it up and beat it. And it's going to look like something. So set those goals, get those goals, and then go beyond that and do, you know, do things that are good, not just for you, but for all the people around you. Um, we, we talked about this the other day, the Stay in the Fight Foundation that we started. Are we, you still got enough time for yeah, that? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, absolutely. Like, yeah, talk so, about that. And yeah, so we started the Stay in the Fight Foundation, and it's a nonprofit that's truly a nonprofit. Mm. It's not a nonprofit where we pay a bunch of people to be working for a nonprofit. And if you do that, people out there don't get mad and throw stuff at me. Fine, do that. We're not you. You're, you do your thing. Mm. We don't take one single dime when people donate to that. And I'm not going to go deep into how that started, but that makes me feel good because we are able to help other people. And it's not for law enforcement or military. It's for anybody that's a human being that has a job. So that's the next step. How can we help other people? Fiscally, we're fine. Does that mean I'm rich? No, it doesn't mean I'm rich, but I'm fine. I'm, I'm, I get a very good retirement from the military. Once the VA found out I'm actually cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. They even raised my retirement <laughs> pay. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I, I'm fine. I, I'm good. I can live very cheaply in Tennessee. There's no state income tax. There's a good place for a Ooh, farm right down the road I'm thinking there. About it. Yep. But set your goals, attain your goals, and then go on to goals that will help other people 
as well. And if you're, if you're making money just to make money, good for you, do whatever you're, that, uh, that's your business. But for me, I don't, I don't really like money because it just, it, it does bad things to people. We're lucky because my wife and I are on the same sheet of music. We don't, we have a very nice place to live. We have very nice acreage to live on. Mm-hmm. Um, we have vehicles that are not junkers. That's it. We don't spend a lot of money on crazy stuff. If you do, then you probably ought to set a higher fiscal <laughs> goal than, than I set. But we are, we are very, very happy with where we're at. I mean, I'm, I'm, that doesn't mean I don't go to those dark places, but what I've been able to do is get into a good place. And then I've got guys and gals that are my support structure and they're not all military yeah, and they're not all law enforcement. They're just people that I can talk to and I can tell them anything. And when I say that they don't, it doesn't affect our relationship when I tell them what's going on inside my head. Yeah. Some people, if they saw that, they'd be like, Whoa, this dude is a weirdo. Yep. I am a weirdo and I'm looking for other weirdos to be my friends. Mm. So that's why you and I get along perfect. I, I know, guess. I love- yeah. So we're all, we're both weirdos, but Hey, thank you for letting me uh, come in here and do this. And uh, man, I wish you continued success and keep, you know, keep searching for whatever it is. Cause I don't know what it is. You don't know what it is, but yeah, I, I've found it. Yeah. So yeah. I'm very content. That doesn't mean I'm, like I said, that doesn't mean I don't take a trip down to never, never land every now and again, but now I know how to handle that yeah. a little better. Well, I, I, that, you know, we're transitioning into um, Kyle doing the, um, the little meet and greet in a seminar talking about his experiences. I think that's what's most impactful because when you communicate that, and you give people perspective, it, it gives them just a more narrow field of view and kind of collecting their thoughts and ideas. Because a lot of people make a lot of gross mistakes throughout their life and they pay for them. But if you have perspective, which uh, hopefully you got some perspective from this uh, podcast and listening to your experiences, which I have since the beginning, um, man, it's it's a fascinating thing. It's It's so cool to see this cycle of life and see such positive things come of it. Like it's not going to be a, a clean auto bond. There's going to be bumpy roads, but you've lived it and you've experienced it. And sharing with that with me and with people was impactful, man. My son and I, when, when I was stationed at first group, we had a hot tub out behind our house and we lived right on the Nisqually river. And one morning we're having this discussion. I mean, it was cold and we're sitting in the hot tub and it's steaming up. And, and I was talking to my son, he who was pretty young at the time about we were going to leave and we we're going to go back to Fort Bragg and I was going to go off to combat. And I didn't really realize it at the time, but my son looked at me and he goes, dad, aren't you afraid of dying? And I said, no, son, I'm afraid of not living. So I would challenge everybody out there. Don't worry about dying when it's your time. There ain't nothing you can do about it. But until that time you can live. And li- live, that doesn't mean you're out doing crazy stuff. Live and do things that, uh, if somebody told you this, if, they, if I told you today, if I said, Mike, I'm your doctor, and you've got six months to live, what would you do? Would you do what you're doing, or would you do something different? And that's only something that you can answer. So if, if you think that you're fine, dying in six months, you'd be happy living your life the way it is then keep living the way it is. And I'm going to tell you right now, I'm perfectly happy with the way I'm living. I love that perfect way to end it, Kyle. Thank you so much for being on the podcast, man. God bless America. Yeah, VikingTackets.com, Kyle Lamb. Thanks, guys. Peace.